so today we're talking with Stu Burbrower. Did I get that pronounced right? Burbrower sounds right. Okay, and Stu has been creative director, film producer, all around good guy, and um, any other hats I'm leaving out? I was in the army, captain, and I was a baseball player. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Shortstop. <laughs> But for the purpose of this interview, we're going to focus on all your advertising history, or at okay. least a little teeny bit of it anyway. So your advertising history goes back to the early 60s. 1960, uh, exactly. Right after I got out of the Army, I uh, took my portfolio and I went uh, to Madison Avenue, and, and I got a job in a couple weeks. Nice. Yeah. And at some point after that, you started producing some of the most notable commercials from that era of the 60s and the 70s and into the 80s? 90s even. Into the 90s, okay. For big national brands. What are some of the favorite national brands that you recall? Uh, I worked on uh, <clears throat> um, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Band-Aids, General Foods, Procter & Gamble, Colgate, Palmolive, uh, Bristol-Myers, um, Delta Airlines, uh, Coca-Cola, did I say that? And um, Avis. Avis. Um, Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts of America. New York State Lottery. Um, I worked on Ford. I worked on Chrysler. I worked on Goodyear Tires. Um, I worked on everything except fashion. Mm. And, um, you know, um, clothes. I didn't know anything about it, okay. that subject. I also didn't work on cigarettes because I didn't want to. Mm. And um, but mostly food, packaged goods, and um, and they were uh, big international companies with huge budgets. I was uh, shocked that I had all this billing. I was responsible for. Um, so I did that through the 60s and 70s and 80s. Okay, so it would be safe <clears throat> to actually say you're like one of the original Mad Men. Uh, definitely, I think. Not the guy kind that smoked, because I never smoked. And But I, I could be, you know, the guy who drank. Okay. You know, because a martini was a nice thing, and uh, I got most of my ideas after having a martini. Mm. Straight up with olives. All right. Well, let's get right into the <clears throat> advertising and the heart of the stuff that we want to uh, convey in this in this interview. What would you say are the basic concepts of advertising in general? Create awareness and demand for your product. Because if you don't tell them about it, they're not going to know about your product and uh, they're not going to buy it. So... If you look at all the great companies in the world, and what do they have in common? They all advertise. They all have huge advertising budgets. And that's how they became big. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, it stimulates um, the economies of everybody in the world, every country in the world. Okay. So in, in the process of trying to create awareness, for example, what would you say are the, the main points that uh, make that awareness building more effective or more poignant? Um, to create awareness, you have to find a, the big idea and, uh, of, of a product. And there are certain rules that you can use. Uh, one thing I liked always was uh, three things. Um, catch their eye, penetrate their mind, and warm their heart. Because people get emotionally involved. And, and those are the three things. And if you do those three and add some music to it, I think that usually works. That usually uh, helps sell your product and gives it a uh, it's memorable and uh, and um, makes um, you it gives you a, an image of higher quality for your product. Good point. Let's speak a little about the music you brought up a moment ago. 
What is the process of selecting music to go with uh, a commercial message? First, you have the idea, and maybe there's music that that is attached to the idea. Um, like, um, I did a campaign called uh, I'm Stuck on a Band-Aid, because mm. the Band-Aid stuck on me. I didn't like the line. I thought it was dumb. And uh, I couldn't come up with visuals. I know that they had extra glue on the Band-Aid, and it stuck, and, that, and then that's why Clients were loyal, but it wasn't enough. And and then, I don't know if it was me or my writer said, uh, well, let's set it to music. And I couldn't visualize, I'm stuck on a Band-Aid because a Band-Aid stuck on me. But we brought it to a music house, which writes jingles, and they came up with a tune. And that campaign took off mm. because of the music only because, well, maybe not only, but that was the key thing, I think. Okay. The music. So you got the original uh, jingle writers, or you can take something from public domain, or you could buy the Beatles, or a song like that. Of course, that will cost you a million dollars, at least. So that's why original music um, is a good idea, because they write the music exactly to the picture mm -hmm. and when the music the picture cuts the music changes and that helps drive everything I love music I've always put music on my uh, on my commercials good now speak to the creative process so when you get an account and you want to represent a product how do you do that <laughs> the hard part is getting the account the second hard part is He's, getting ideas are easy. Protecting the ideas are hard because they want to test everything and test it until they kill it. <laughs> no committee or no focus group ever came up with a great idea. They've killed great ideas. And what you end up is a mishmash of uh, bland. Mm. Uh, but um, what you do is you get, educate yourself on the, client, on the client's product. And you... Um, what I do is I ask two questions, uh, and, and I'm giving away my secrets after uh, 50 years. Number one, my question is, what do people think of your product or service or restaurant or whatever? What do people think of your product? And two, what do you want them to think of your product? And that's all I need to know. The first part, he, it's hidden. He starts telling me about his company and his history and his product and how it became this way. And, and, and then he tells me what he wishes should happen. Like everybody in the world wants, want, I want them to buy my product. Well, that's not uh, what I'm looking for. Um, it's image we're talking about. And people... If they think a product is cool and everybody who's cool uses it that I want to use. So it's those two things. It's what do they think of your product and what do you want them to think of your product? Good. So um, a lot of people um, would be amazed on how simple it is. That's probably why uh, um, I'm still around doing this kind of thing because uh, I simplified it and I eliminated all the clutter. Um, the problem is they overthink things. Mm. And when you have committees and when you have research and when you have focus groups, there's so much data coming in. It uh, comes out to paralysis by an an uh, analysis, right. they, they can't, there's nothing that sticks out. Yeah. The reason I don't like research and focus groups and committees is you can't measure emotion. Mm. And um, people get emotionally involved in your product. All right, do well. 
I'm going to wrap this up here. Is there any closing thoughts you'd like to add to the viewers? You've got to hook them in four, the first four seconds. Or, um, you know, years ago, people have to get up, cross the room, change the channel on the TV. Now, now, now they're standing there with the, with the, uh, with the remote in their hand and their, their finger on the button. <laughs> so, they're, they're, you know, talk about trigger happy. All right, well, thank you very much for sharing your experience, too. All right, next time you come, I'll give you a martini. All right, very good. Take care. Thank you.